Good morning, everyone. Great to see you. Hey, you all right? Good. Um, so I've been asked to speak today um, about God's salvation. So that's what I'm going to try and do. And uh, the verses I were given were from Ephesians 2. And um, I'll just start by reading it and we can listen. So, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is the word of the Lord. So Jesus saves, I spend. That was a joke. Um, not a very funny joke, but you know, it's all right. That's the, that's the last one. That's the last one of the day. So, All right, Paul. Okay, it's no use. So, um, yeah, Jesus saves. What does he save from? What does that mean? So I, I was listening to um, uh, an interview with a, a comedian who's a Christian, and he said he grew up in the church, and it was like, he had the antidote, the antidote before he knew what the disease was. And I think it can be a bit like that, you know, grow up in the church or been around it a lot. It's like, well, what, what does that mean, Jesus saves? What are we being saved from? And um, this guy, Jesus, who turned up in the world all these years ago, um, at the announcement of his coming in Matthew 121, it says, the angel said, she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins, from their sins. So that which we, not that which we just do wrong, but humanity is broken at its very core. So from, I'm not one of these people who believes that children are bad. I'm not, you know, some people say that, oh, by two, you know that they're sinners. I'm not one of those, because I think children are just growing and learning, right? Um, but there is something that we hit at some point in our life. Maybe it's to lie. Maybe it's to, to steal. Maybe it's to, you know, just kind of generally be disobedient. But whatever it is for you, um, we all struggle with this sense of, you know, we are broken humanity. There is sin in the world. And if you zoom out into the bigger picture, look at our world and what is happening in it. So that's evidence of there being sin, separation from God. Now, God so loved the world that he sent his, own, his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Yeah? Uh, in Isaiah 51, there's this um, sort of passage that, that I came across when I first became a Christian, and it really seemed significant to me, but I didn't really know why. It was like God was highlighting this, this verse to me, but I didn't really understand it. But it says this, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have built barriers between you and your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear. For your hands are stained with blood, your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken lies, and your tongue mutters injustice. Powerful and confrontational, isn't it? God going, I'm not too deaf, it's you. <laughs> it's you guys have moved. And we see that right in the, in the beginning, in Genesis, the first generation of mankind. We get this picture of um, disobedience, sin entering the world, partnership with the serpent, and cast out of the garden. And for the first time, death 
comes into the world, right? With, uh, you know, God actually kills animals to cover their shame. And we get that first moment of these vegan, <laughs> these vegan uh, humans. Suddenly, Eden is lost. And it's this picture of this great tragedy of continuing distance from God. And in the second generation, we see the first envy, the first murder, uh, brother on brother. Isn't that horrific? <laughs> what a state and what a mess we're in. So our sins have separated us from God. So really, we are in a, a predicament. And um, so Jesus came to save us from our sin. Um, he also came to save us from that serpent that was in the garden. And the serpent was the one who lied, right? Another name for him is the father of lies. And Jesus is the truth. He is the antidote to sin. He is the antidote to lies because he is the truth. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Good Christians, well done. Um, I'm going to go back a little bit and read these verses in their context, which is going to help a lot because it's Bible, not Mark. Here we go. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But, God, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Isn't it amazing how when you have a service like this and, you know, maybe Vivian will pray something and Margaret will write something and Josh will sing something, and all these sort of threads start to, start to come through. So one has been the kindness and the mercy of God. Another has been the holiness of God. And those two things are really sort of on display in this, in this passage. We see this image of, well, if you're dead in your sin, that, that's pretty hopeless, isn't it? Dead person, that doesn't get much worse. <laughs> But we get Jesus dying. You know, I was, I was talking to Lemmy um, about this, and I, I was sort of saying, "Well, what, what? Um, you know, I've got to do this talk, and uh, da 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 da." And he said, "Well, Jesus died on the cross for the sins, same as every week. Same sermon every week, right? Jesus died on the cross for for the sins of the world. Um, so yeah, pretty need to listen to that guy." Um, so yeah, we just see this thing of we were following the ways of the world. We were following the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Another, that's another word for Satan. Um, one of the things that's been interesting, a sort of shift in society that we're seeing at the moment is people becoming aware again of good and evil and truth and lies. And it's sort of happening on a, I guess it, we could trace it back to fake news and then we could trace it back maybe to the pandemic and sort of a lot of the lies that were told around that. And, and it's actually causing people to say, hang on a minute, there's something really evil about this. If there's something really evil, maybe there's something really good. You know, if, it, if there's a devil, I've actually heard people say this to me, if there's a devil, there must be a God. But it's almost like, you know, you see the darkness, it's like, well, it's the absence of light, <laughs> isn't it? So is it, it's an interesting time. Um, you know, I think as we come out of this sort of, oh, science is the answer, it's just rationalism, materialism, 
And actually, that's not our worldview as Christians. We're spiritual beings. Angels are real. Demons are real. Or, you know, we live in this um, spiritual reality. God is, is a spirit who can be known and who is among us. And we have to throw off that world, the ways of the world, the thinking of the world, and we take up following Jesus. So he saves us from sin. He saves us from spiritual darkness. Um, we know that our, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the powers and the rulers in the heavenly places. Um, we're saved from our sins. We're saved from Satan. And we're also saved from judgment, the judgment that's coming from the wrath of God, God's righteous anger against evil. And we get to leave our sins at the cross where Jesus took the punishment and the judgment that was meant for the sins of the world. And we get to step into that risen Christ. And that's what baptism represents. So shout out to those who were baptized recently. You've, you've taken a big step there in doing that. God's judgments are right and true. We don't get to decide what they are. And if we did, it would be kind of look like the mess of the world now. <laughs> but thanks be to God, his judgments are true and right. And, um, you know, when we think about the holiness of God, God is so pure and so light. There's nothing evil as Natalie reminded us today, there's nothing evil in God. He's good and he's kind. So we can expect an absolute righteous judge. Um, now, that is a little bit of a problem for us as well because none of us are righteous to the standard of Jesus. Thanks be to God for his grace. The wages of sin are death, but the gift of God is eternal life. You know, other things that we're saved from, one would be fear, fear of that judgment, fear of punishment, that, you know, the Bible says perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. So we don't need to fear that judgment anymore. If you are in Christ, you have been saved from that. You won't face that. Um, that's a huge relief, and that's grace. He bore our shame. We're increasingly living in a shame culture, aren't we? Somebody does something wrong, like, I don't know, Keir Starmer, he's got things in his life, and all of a sudden, shame. Shame on you. People even demonstrate, don't they? And they shout, shame on you, <laughs> shame on you. We sort of come into this shame culture of, you know, the internet, social media. Someone does something, everybody's, ah! They say things they would never say face-to-face -face <laughs> against people because um, probably you'd end up fighting. Um, but, you know, Jesus bore our shame on the cross. He took it all, everything we're embarrassed about, every, you know, all the mistakes we've made, even as Christians, the mistakes we've made, he took that on us, on himself, from us, on himself. So how does this happen? How are we saved? Um, well, it's by grace. It's by grace that none should boast. It's a gift. It's not earned. We don't deserve it. It's a gift. So what do you have to do with a gift? Receive it. <laughs> Say thank you. Say thank you. So by grace, through faith. Um, so by the cross, you know, Jesus' mission was to, was to go to that cross. It says he set his face like flint. He wouldn't be stopped from going to the cross. And do you remember there's a moment where um, Peter says to him, uh, so in Matthew 16, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hand of the elders, chief priests, and the teachers of law. And that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. 
Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. And Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Jesus was on a mission to die on a cross. He knew where he was going. He knew what he was doing. He knew what had been prophesied, and he knew who he was. That was his mission. Um, poor, poor old Peter, you know, best intentions in the world to look after Jesus. But he didn't understand what was going on. But Jesus understood. Jesus understood. So in Colossians it says, Once you were alienated from God and were hostile in your minds, engaging in evil deeds, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy, unblemished, and blameless in his presence, if indeed you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope of the gospel you heard, which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. He's reconciled us to God through his blood on the cross. That's how it's happened. We have to believe. We have to have faith. We have to receive that gift. And the fact that this was a historical thing that happened is incredible. <laughs> that Jesus rose from the dead. Amazing. There's a moment in the book of Acts where um, the, uh, the disciples are in prison and they begin to sing and the prison doors open and this, there's this jailer character who I imagine is sort of like a creeping, you know, Monty Python type thing. And he comes and, and he realizes, he thinks, oh no, you know, the prisoners have escaped. I'm going to have to end it all. I'm in deep trouble. This is it. I'm going <laughs> to kill myself. He's quite a, an interesting character, right? <laughs> That's his first response. He's going to jump on his sword. And they say, no, wait, <laughs> wait, don't do it, don't do it, it's all right, we're still here. We haven't run away, we're still, the doors are open, but we're still here. And um, he says, sirs, <laughs> sirs, what must they do to be saved? Because he was from Bristol. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> um, and they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. This amazing thing, they end up going around his house having some crumpets and tea or something, I don't know. Um, and his whole family is baptized and they're saved. Believe, believe in Jesus. It's quite simple and quite hard to do, to keep doing. That's what's kind of good about getting together, isn't it, in church, singing these songs reading the Bible together, praying together, is that it helps us remember what our actual story is um, and what we are a part of. All right. So, last bit. What are we saved to? What are we saved to? Well, one of the most important things is a relationship. We are saved to a relationship with the Father, with the Spirit, and with the Son. So, in the uh, book of John 17, it says that Jesus prays this. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he may give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Jesus said that eternal life is relationship with the Father. So eternal life begins now <laughs> and goes on, past death, to the resurrection, into the future. So what are we being saved to? 
we're being saved into a relationship, a restored relationship with the Father. And um, I don't know about you, but like sometimes I, do, I sort of, I, you know, you've got to pray for Veronica because she has to live with me. But I'm so up and down. And sometimes, sometimes I think, do I really know God? Do I, have I really got a relationship with God? Do I really know Jesus? And then other times I'm like, and the angels cry. <laughs> I love you. you know, and, and I feel him, feel his presence. Really, I often I just cry because of his mercy. Um, was, uh, others of you might be a bit more steady in your faith. Um, but, you know, just uh, thanks for praying for me, by the way, on my trip. But it was a real sense of, yeah, we do, we do know him. We do love him. And, you know, sometimes it's like we know Jesus is around all the time, like we're doing the washing up. We know he's kind of there somewhere. But then there's a, a moment where it's like Jesus catches your eye. Jesus, you know, you see that look in his eye. And actually, you, usually what happens is you know you're going to be okay. <laughs> you know he loves you and you're not, you know, in my case it would be you're not failing him. You're not letting him down. You're not, you know, he loves you. He loves you. He's done it all. It's by grace you've been saved through faith. But no one can boast. You know, it's the great leveler. The cross is the great leveler because however good you are, you know, you're nowhere near good enough. <laughs> and it's okay. You are loved in your brokenness. I am loved in my brokenness. Um, one of the hardest things to accept is that God loves you. God loves me. It's such a simple concept, but it's a lifetime of undoing stuff. Yeah. So we've been saved into relationship. We've been saved into freedom. We've been saved into his with free access into his presence, you know, confidence that he has washed our sins away, we can come to the Father. We're called into purpose, you know, God is, you, know, you don't have to work for your salvation, but he's got stuff for you to do <laughs> in advance, prepared in advance. Big things, small things, could be stroking a dog, being kind to a creature, could be you know, serving your family it could be doing something, you know, in your work, in your job, in your workplace, wherever it is, he's got things for us to do um, prepared in advance. We're saved into a family. We're adopted into the Father's house. <laughs> and we have all these wonderful, weird and wonderful brothers and sisters all around the world who, you know, when we were in Argentina years ago now, we were in this taxi with this guy, and somehow it came out that we were Christians. Oh, he asked what, maybe what I did. Oh, yeah, you know, work for a church. All of a sudden, he's driving like this, you know, like looking at us, all animated, opens his glove box, gets his Bible out, yeah, I got saved here, and you know, just like family straight away, the other side of the world, and we've got everything in common because we love Jesus and we just get it. Yeah, isn't he amazing? Isn't he amazing? And I've experienced that all over the place. I'm sure you, I hope you have as well. Um, and I hope you know you're in the family here. So, yep. Um, Okay, I'm kind of done, I think. Okay, there's one more thing. So we're saved into relationship with the Father. We're saved into the community of one another. And we're also saved into, uh, we are heading towards a new heavens and a new earth. So just like Jesus' body was resurrected, 
this earth will go through some kind of transformation, resurrection, it will go through the fire, it will be purged of sin, and it will be made new. It will be the same, but different. (laughs) We will recognize it. There will be creatures, there will be plants, there will be, it's a new heaven and a new earth. We're not ghosts floating around disembodied in the clouds somewhere, because Jesus is a man in heaven with a body. <laughs> he ate, do you remember he ate the fish and the bread and he still had the holes in his hands to show that, but they didn't quite recognize him. There's a new creation coming when all will be well. Every tear will be wiped from our eyes and injustice will be just a, some kind of a memory Maybe. I don't know how it's going to work. No one does. Um, But, you know, Romans 8.22 puts it beautifully like this. We know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until the present time. Not only that, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is not hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? (laughs) But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it patiently. We have this hope. So we're called to, we're saved into, we're saved from our sins, we're saved out of the dominion of darkness, we're saved into relationship with the Father, we're saved into a family of brothers and sisters, and we're saved into where we're headed. (laughs) We have the first fruits now. We see it dimly now, but we will see it fully. Um, This hope that doesn't disappoint Um, yeah it is by grace we have been saved through faith and this not from ourselves it is the gift of God not by works so that no one can boast Um, can we stand together we've been sitting for a while Um, what must I do to be saved believe in the Lord Jesus elsewhere it says repent and believe and just a quick demo of what repentance is I'm going this way I need to turn 180 degrees and walk towards Jesus yeah So it's as much about turning to Jesus as it is turning away from things. In fact, clear from this passage, we actually don't even have the power in our own strength to turn away from our sins. (laughs) We definitely don't have the power to forgive ourselves for them, you know, without his grace. So it's turning, you know, often it's like, religion is like, oh, I've got to do better. I've got to stop doing this, stop doing that, stop doing the other. But Jesus did something different with grace and truth. He said, turn from your sin, come to me. You know, the prodigal son ran, well, the father ran to the prodigal son, right? Just turn back, just come back, wherever you are. So, I'm going to pray together. There might be, I don't know, there might be someone here, it's your first time that you've ever considered that um, take that step today amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost now I'm found blind now I see let's pray together Father thank you for your indescribable gift your amazing mercy on me 
Thank you, Jesus, that you took the sins of the world on yourself and you died and was buried and then you rose and overcame them. Help us this morning to receive that gift by faith and to then turn from our sin and turn to you. We choose to do that this morning as a community, Lord, to turn to you again, to worship you, the one true God, to know you and to make you known. Thank you. So, Josh, would you mind coming up? Um, so I'd like to invite you for prayer and um, if you've prayed, you want to accept Jesus, come forward. Um, if you've got specific trouble accepting God's grace, accepting God's love for you, I invite you to come and get some prayer this morning. And uh, just remember those words of knowledge as well. Um, yeah, I think we probably need to do a soft, ending today so we'll close there if you want prayer the guys will just or do you want to do a song why don't we do a song all together let's do a song all together and then after that people come forward yeah let's do that yeah yeah right we're gonna sing how great thou art do it <laughs>